Last time on Base Funk. After the fight, Garrick retreated here in order to find information on us or do something about us. Caused what we know as the Stalker to get out of its captivity. And then he started shooting ice everywhere like I spooked him. It's a snowflake. The first frost. The actual invention of snow. Hmm. And that it is a religious artifact that is presumed to exist. An angel, some other spirit of the god itself. It could be a physical manifestation of the artifact. It could be all these things. Does that at least give us a direction to start heading? Or a direction that he left the, the building from? Let's say it's the direction that Hawthorne House is in. Teenage girl that you gave the winged snake to? Uh, she had pointed ears. She paid me in, like, a bunch of cool stuff. She had, like, uh, custom, like, handmade jewelry. I have uh, Judgment, I guess the big angel guy, Hermit, which is your spooky skeleton friend, and the world. I think she's going to start by flying towards the area which uh, Garrick went, so, like, towards Hawthorne House, but clearly he didn't go, or at least it doesn't seem he went into the house. We didn't see the skeletons frozen or anything like that, and they're aggressive, so I don't think he went into the house. That not all of these skeletons are created equal. 27. New creature? Uh, so what, what you rolled on was the reincarnation table. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. 27 is High Elf. <laughs> oh. Zoe, you don't know this right away, but you can only speak in rhyme. I'm gonna cast- I'm gonna cast Misty Step Oh my backwards. god. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, gold coins are just falling off of your person. Just erupting money? Yeah, absolutely. Just from your hands, basically. You're just like, like as if you were holding a handful of gold coins, but infinitely. Asriel. I don't think that name's come up for us yet. Got your asses kicked in his front yard. Or I guess, I mean, it was his front yard. How were we explaining through the ice then? It seems like that's not in his control. It seems like it's something that happens... On his behalf, like you said, there was a veil of silence, so he couldn't even cast any spells, and yet it was the ice was attacking you. Hmm. And then he got spooked, and the ice attacked your house? Yeah. And he uses devices instead of spells. I I think you guys actually have it all wrong. The, you're looking for someone who has no power. Even, even if Wolf is not Garrick, I'm pretty sure that Garrick got their invitation from Wolf. If you guys can stay close enough that you are out of sight... I can come with you as a cloud of mist. And she drops the corpse, dressed in the ceremonial burial robes of the triad. You recognize this person. So there's a body that has <laughs> it has bur- uh, burial robes on that are tied to the triad, which oh, yeah. which then leads me to my next question. You said I recognize this person. Do do you, do I can I tell by looking at them who it is immediately? So let's set up this scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys were all going over your Garrick the Great detective notes. Yes, when. Uh, Claudia Rock brought a zombie over to your guys' house, dropped it on your porch, and said, Hey, I bagged one, but there's a weird symbol on their clothes. It's a symbol specifically of the Order of the Merciful Sword. Um, And you do recognize this person if you walk over and look. So she kind of just dropped them face down, and there's blood on their face because she shot, like, an emerald through his forehead. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because she was like, oh, it's just another one of the zombies that are after Dora. And that is true. So to be clear... So far, in this kind of side quest where zombies (laughs) keep going after Dora, so far you guys haven't recognized any of them, and they've all been dressed like perfectly nice and with no obvious wounds. So it seemed like they died naturally. And but this one is different, and that might seem like weird, or like I've just contrived an excuse to combine something with of Roland's backstory with Dora's backstory. (laughs) But it's weird in universe. Like this is a coincidence that your characters are like. 
this is messed up in a major way and that is that is something to take note of that's important so having having seen these robes i think veltari is just doing like the the cartoon just like whistle of just like don't look my way oh yeah so veltari has killed <laughs> some order of the merciful sword people so she's seen the symbol she recognizes it she doesn't say anything and yet unless she wants to no by just cartoon whistle in the corner <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah uh roland i take it you actually want to look at this person and then i'll tell you who they are yes all right so you recognize this person immediately his name was warder Taywold. That's Warder, W-A-R-D-E-R, Taywold, T-E-W-O-L-D. Mm-hmm. A human, male, dead. Uh, if you want to describe your relationship or any notable things about this guy, you, you feel free. But the important thing for us is that he's dead. <laughs> okay, uh, Warder, probably around the same age, but because he was human, he appeared older than, uh, than Roland back when they were working together. The significance about this is not simply that this was a human that Roland knew in the past, but that they specifically worked together as a subset of the Knightly Order of the Merciful Sword. They sort of had their own specially made sort of task force that they kind of called themselves as uh, the Scales of Justice was the name they went by. The And Warder is one of the five people that Roland specifically was trying to spare from the punishment for for basically breaking orders. I mean, it was part of the uh, knightly order uh, by allowing himself to take the brunt of the punishment that the rest of his team was supposed to take and allowing himself to be the only one that was kicked out. So now he's standing in front of someone that he basically sacrificed his standing with the knightly order to effectively spare him. And here he is dead. And now become now begins the process where Roland's going to try to figure out why warder is dead at all in the first place, which uh, first thing he's going to do, it's going to try a medicine check on warder just, and he's doing this all si- uh, in silence. His, his expression is shocked Dora has never seen Roland like this ever, and I'm fairly certain that neither of the others have. Uh, Winnie, likely to have never seen Roland this sort of stance either, where he's basically uh, basically shocked that someone who, in some ways, was probably a a stronger cleric than he was a paladin was just laid out like this. So uh, he's going to do the... uh, He's going to do his medicine check... Uh, as a 14 to kind of gauge how how uh, how cold is the body and stuff like that yeah so 14 means uh like qualified nurse but not quite like surgeon so sure you flip this body over and you give him a respectful once over Mm -hmm. uh here's the important things that you get from this examination one is unlike the other zombies you've seen so far this person appeared to have died violently uh more specifically they have what was an enormous stab wound through their torso which has of course been closed and you know right. made proper for burial because there's an, uh, an embalming process so they wouldn't just leave that but it's the size of this weapon and I'm, I'm just going to give this to you it is familiar to you because the order of the merciful sword is not just a name right it is also the thing they use specifically they kind of got this nickname from using these enormous buster swords um which like the highest ranking people used you're very familiar with this kind of wound and specifically as you said there's kind of the the elite of the elites of the order of the merciful sword which you called the scales of justice which was basically your unit Mm -hmm. so here's what roland knows this wound was made by somebody within the order this was made by one of their swords okay here's what veltari knows the, the person who gave the, the corrupt order to slaughter the orc civilians that led to Roland being kicked out. He is in charge of the Order of the Merciful Sword. The scales of justice have been disbanded, and they are now essentially Count Danto's private army. The entire order is corrupt, and he uses them as enforcers and thugs and basically to do whatever he wants. That They were corrupt before, which is why Roland is an ilium to begin with, but they weren't willing to kind of answer to anyone until Veltari <laughs> went there and killed a bunch of people and kind of brought them to heal. So whatever led to Warder being dead on your floor right now seems to be a pretty direct result 
of Viltari intervening on behalf of Count Danto. Ah, heck. But none of you know any of this, so I'm fine. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not clear how this body ended up getting caught up in whatever is happening with Dora. That doesn't seem to be directly related. It just seems like wherever the bodies are coming from happen to cross paths with what is basically appears to be a purge of people. And if, I mean, Roland says basically that he took Warder's punishment. So, you know, Warder probably wasn't as corrupt as everyone else in the order. So it seems like with a 14, you don't know for sure. This is what you're pretty confident of. You think maybe Galen got rid of Warder. (laughs) Roland, Roland's going to take a deep sigh and then he's going to look straight to Veltari and he's going to ask her, uh, Veltari, I know this is going to be a bit selfish of me to ask, but can can you do that ritual, that spell that you cast on, uh, on Lyra, uh, on this man here? I will do what I can. And we will see what we can do. Um, I'm a little unsure about doing this out of character because obviously, like, <laughs> I don't know what's going to be said. But also, I'm I'm not quite sure how to not grant that request. <laughs> oh, fuck. This is juicy drama. Uh, can you fake it? <laughs> Austin forgot you could do this. It's so good. Yeah, how could you forget that? That was the central thing to this entire arc that we had. was <laughs> her using speaks with dead. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I completely forgot I had that ability and that I might be asked to use it. <laughs> here, here, I'll, I'll give Austin one out for this. Uh-oh. I like drama. Be clear, I'm a messy bitch. <laughs> Speak with Dead specifically stipulates that the uh, the corpse cannot be undead. Now, ah, uh. <laughs> that, that's up to you to determine whether this guy was actually undead. I was going to suggest sh- roll performance to fake it. <laughs> What to to fake doing the the spell? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if that would work, but I do have a really high performance. And and Roland and Roland has the easy way to detect stuff like this. Oh, that's true. Yeah, screw it. I'm doing I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the the spell, and I'm just gonna bite the bullet and deal with whatever consequences come when they come. So I light the incense and I begin to play music the whole time, just in my head, just going, shit, 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 (laughs) shit. (laughs) Oh my god. So what's amazing about this is that you have inadvertently stumbled upon a bunch of new information before we even get to the juicy drama stuff. Oh god. (laughs) As Skitch said, this spell doesn't work on undead, which zombies are, and it works. (gasps) Oh, shit. (laughs) Uh, So, Warder Taywold sits up. And he says, as soon as Austin finds his voice, because I wasn't expecting this character to talk. um... (laughs) (laughs) Never introduce a character unless you're willing to give him a voice. As a reminder, Austin, the spell description does say that the answers given will be completely unhelpful, like, could be completely unhelpful. So just remember that, Austin. (laughs) I do remember that, and I also remember you guys just accepting Lyra's version of events without question. Hmm. Mm, yeah. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, but the difference is, is that I wasn't on the line at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Five questions, guys. Well, Roland's going to look at you and say, and just say, the first question I want you to ask, ask him. His name is Warder, by the way. Mm. Ask him if his spirit is with the triad right now. Ask him if his spirit is at rest among Torm, Tyr, or Ilmater, among any of them. W- Warder, um, I know this is going to be slightly confusing for you, but um, do you know if your spirit is currently with the Triad or not? I, I, I don't rightly know. I, all I remember is pain and blackness, and then walking, and then more blackness, and now I'm sitting here, so I can't remember the afterlife if I got there. Mm. This is the thing with the spell. I probably should have brought up uh, Roland, but I, uh, as as I understand it, I believe people only know what they knew while they were alive. So it was something I still felt like uh, it needed to be asked. You know, I understand. I had to. You know, I I did the same with Lyra, obviously trying to find out if she had any final wishes. You know, sometimes you just got to do these things. Uh, uh, it should be noted that Roland visibly actually looks like he's tearing up all uh just by hearing Warder's voice is 
it's making him it's making it hard for him to kind of keep himself composed right now. Dora's gonna give him a soothing pat on, I guess, his elbow or something because she's short. Warder, you you mentioned being aware of the blackness and then remembering walking. I assume this is you having memories of whatever time you were moving after your death. Um, so I guess my question is, do you have any knowledge of how you ended up here in Ilium? The captain, he sold us to the vampire, and I, I refused. And we fought, and he struck me down. And then I was on the edge of death, but not quite. And I remember the smell of incense in the church, and Mara was there, and then something happened there, and then I lost myself, and all I did was walk. He mentioned the captain. I want you to ask, was it Caden? Was it... Who was it that sold the order? Who... Who was it that sold the order? Captain Galen. Galen Cadun. He sold us to that... That Count Danto. Some, some kind of monster from from far away. He came back here. He's taking over Akamoros with that court magician, that wizard. Out of character, can I check? Is this four questions we've had? We, we had, I think we've had, we've had three so far. That's wishful thinking on my part, trying to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Veltari should have noticed that once he mentioned Danto, uh, his, uh, Roland's glance kind of looks directly over to Veltari. Yep. <laughs> but he keeps it together enough to then ask, who is the court wizard that you're talking about? Um, who is, who's, who's the court wizard? Can, can you tell us? The, they call her the Rose. She's some kind of prodigy. Count Danto is using her as some kind of spectacle. The people love her. He's, he's help, helping him consolidate his power. There's nothing to stop him now. He has, he has the order and he has the wizard. This, this city's in his hands. I'm sorry. I, I, I know this is not a question, Veltari, but I... I I need to at least have this be said to him. Yeah. Just tell him that I'm sorry for for my failures to to keep the team together, to keep the scales together, and I'm sorry that this had come to pass to him. And if there's anything I can do to provide him with a better restful afterlife, to let me know. I unfortunately suspect that if you want to know about his final wishes, that will have to be a question if he's going to give an answer. I know. I know it is. And I, I can make that a question if you want, but as you started saying it wasn't a question, I want to make sure that you want to use one of these for this. And I understand doing so. I did the same. I just want to make sure that you know. This is the last question I'm aware. Okay. Roland is sorry, and he is... He's sorry that he he couldn't prevent what happened to you, and he wants you to know that if there's anything he can do for you, to let us know, and he will do everything he can to see it done. So, is there anything that can be done to help you? It's it's too late for the city. It's too late to stop the vampire, the court wizard. It's too late to get the order back. The only thing you can do now, Roland, please... You have to save Mara. She's the only one there who's still fighting. In secret. She hasn't been turned yet. Please. Uh, Roland just silently nods and draws the uh, the body of Warder in, in, a, in a comforting hug as the animating spirit probably wafts away from his body. Yes. Uh, he is gone. It's a bummer. For those who haven't read Roland's character sheet, that is Mara, M-A-R-A, Sladen, S-L-E-Y-D-O-N, who was another member of the Scales of, well, the former Scales of Justice, <laughs> currently Count Danto's secret police. <laughs> we should probably talk, Roland. I, I don't know where to start. I'm going to be frank with you. I did not understand the full ramifications of my actions, but... This is going to come out sooner or later. <laughs> Questions are going to happen. I was working for Danto, and I was working for Danto at the time that 
that the Order of the Merciful Sword was taken under Danto's command. Now, I, w- I will tell you this, I was with Danto because as someone that has spent a lifetime being assumed evil before they've acted, Danto was someone that welcomed me in, that gave me stable accommodation and work, and that wasn't terrified by m- the mere presence of me. Now, I appreciate that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't change the things I've done, and I'm not going to lie, I wouldn't undo the things I've done. I did the things I needed to do to survive, and I survived, and I did what I had to. I put myself first, but that doesn't mean I'm happy that this has happened to you. How could they have fallen so fast? Galen's actions have already been out of line with the with the triad, and now he sells out the entire order to a vampire? For what end? For For what purpose? Danto is a very charismatic man who is very good at making people making people happy by giving them what they want and what they need to be happy. And 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 now I'm just realizing there's another thing to what to what Water said that makes me concerned about well about Zoe. So out of character, I don't know if you want me to talk right now because all I could do is speak in rhyme, which I feel is really going to detract from this scene. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's up to you guys. How are you going to handle it? I, I don't mind either way. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to read between the lines of what Warner said and jump to a conclusion. Because mm-hmm. Austin, you jerk. Um, like Roland is just going to say, um, it, it seems very coincidental for Warner to mention the name of the court wizard as the Rose and being some sort of prodigy at magic. I mean, if I was assembling an army of loyal vampire paladins, I would probably also want, like, I don't know, a famous ass-kicking wizard. It may very well be that another one of Danto's, um, I guess no other way to say it, is victims, might be your sister, Zoe. Roland pulls out his little notebook and writing utensil and offers it to Zoe. <laughs> I wanted to like take the pad and she just starts writing on it and she like stops for a moment and then just continues and she's like, damn, this magic is rather biting. It seems to work even in writing. <laughs> <laughs> Magic's good. I, I He then looks back over to Veltari. It would be easy for me to take this information, use it against you. But as much as I feel disappointment among my peers, when following orders from their superior, indicating that it would take great strength to go against an order that they know is wrong. Sometimes the the call of duty and the call of following the orders that you're given overpower other needs. I'm not sure if I'm willing to say that that I'm going to forgive you for what you're talking about here yet, Vatari. But for the time being, I have no choice other than to double my efforts to remove this barrier that surrounds this town and reclaim and recover anything I have left of my past. If you're willing to help me remove this barrier so I can save what remains of the only friends I had, I'm willing to put things to the side for the time being. I I will repeat what I said before. I won't apologize for taking the actions that I took, I did what I had to do for me to survive. And I do not regret that. I do not believe that regretting that is the right thing for me to do. You weren't directly involved with the sale that happened. You were directly involved with Galen, were you? Not the sale. I had other roles involved, but uh, look, I don't want to be trapped in this in this barrier any more than you do. I'm going to lay my cards out on the table here. I still have one directive from Danto while I'm here, which is to to deal with the person that dealt with Bumbershoot. You're planning on killing the Warden, aren't you? I'm planning on dealing with the Warden. Death is unfortunately how these things often pan out. I am open to other ways of dealing with the Warden, but my point, allow me to finish, is that The two things I want done here, one of them is to get rid of this barrier, and the best chance you have is keeping me in this team. It's not going to help you to get rid of me. You have every right to do what you need to do when we get this barrier down, and I will 
I will face any consequences that come then, but I did what I had to do, and my allegiance to Danto goes as far as the orders I had. If if I find a more compelling offer, I don't, there is no reason I need to go back to him, but for someone that did provide me safety and accommodation and employment when I found none anywhere else in the world, I owe them at the very least finishing what I agreed to do. And I know that's probably not what you want to hear, but it's what I'm here doing, so... I know you're not gonna like me, but I'm here, and I want to be a part of this group, and I want to take down this barrier. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say, I'm here, I'm queer, let's kill an angel. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, can I retcon that in? Oh my god. <laughs> I'm here, I'm queer, and I'm gonna kill a fucking angel. <laughs> there you go. Gotta, gotta throw an expletive in it, because, you know, evil. <laughs> yeah, you, you made it cooler. Yeah. <laughs> I'm disappointed that you're working... With, that you've been working with Danto. That being said, that only paints Danto as the arbiter of all that seems to be ailing, well, to be fair, most of us here now. And you'd be surprised what people would do for just free immortality. It's a pretty good bargain. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling that after I depart from here, if that's even possible, I might find myself facing him head on. And I might be doing whatever I can to end his life for everything he's done. But I'm going to need to spend time building a resource of people who are willing to fight by my side to do that. I can't do any of that until I'm out of here. So, what I want to do for now is, one, do you know when you can do that again? The, the, the ritual? I think it's ten days. Yeah, it's, it's going to be ten days before I can ask, ask this guy any more questions. He's been embalmed, so... He should pre stay preserved for a while, and I know this may be discomforting, but if we can keep him. At this point, Claudia speaks up and goes, Okay, so I've been standing here, and it's been kind of awkward, so this is a good part for me to jump in and offer help. I have a big freezer at home. Claudia, you're so cool! <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, don't, if you don't mind being occupied with uh, a body for at least ten days... I'm trying to think what's the funniest thing you can keep in a freezer. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first, here's how my brain works. My first thought was just to say, it's, it's just filled with dildos. It's fine. But why would you keep a dildo in a freezer? Childos is what they're called, dude. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're called childos. It, it's the perfect treat on a hot summer's day. <laughs> <laughs> no. Claudia is going to take. Uh, the body of Warder Taywold home and keep it for 10 days. So I'm, I'm going to direct Trinity to help in the process so we can just load up the body on that and I'll make it easier to be carried. Okay, well, I mean, she can do it with telekinesis, but there's no reason to split hairs. Yeah. You guys are still on the Garrick the Great case. I know a lot of stuff has happened, <sighs> but you were about to set an ambush, if I re may remind everyone listening uh, the, about the events in motion. Roland is, is obviously in the camp of uh, the Festivus <laughs> angle of dealing with this possible party conflict of Serenity now. Yep. So on the way there, I want to talk to Chris just for a second. This will be our travel scene about your new body, because I got some questions and you and I have had some questions mm -hmm. between each other about what it means for you to be a high elf. So first, I just want to real quick talk about what that even is, because it's not consistent from addition of D&D &D to an addition of D&D, &D, let alone across all fantasy fiction. Right. So the shortest possible summary is once upon a time, there were things called Eladrins in another plane of existence called the Feywild. Then some of them came to the prime material plane, which is where the game is set. And those are the elves that we know of, like the Legolas elves. <laughs> like when yeah, you think of bow and arrow elves, everything like that. Exactly. They're the descendants of the super elves, the Eladrin. These elves the just capital E elves are have two main ethnic groups, the wood elves and the high elves. And you can just kind of think of them as like Americans and British people. <laughs> like they're the same <laughs> species. They share a language, they share culture, but they have like some minor sociological differences. So you look like Orlando Bloom, basically. <laughs> I mean, teenage girl, Orlando. Well, yeah, Orlando Bloom. That's what I said. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the only thing that's super important is that you got a free cantrip, which you can explain to the audience if you want. Everything else is kind of up in the air if you want to describe any, like, your appearance in general. It's, it's kind of up to you. Well, that's actually, yeah, I, I did want to ask you about that, because the, 
the the table you rolled on for this was the reincarnation table so i don't know if it's to imply that zoe like the magic actually caused zoe to reincarnate as just some like if you were in a like a video game character creator and you just mm-hmm. hovered over high elf and then hit randomize essentially or if it was what she would be as though she were a high elf you know if you were to take the same like eye color hair color etc cetera, etc cetera. There's some wiggle room. So there's short answer is what is most interesting. Slightly longer answer is, do you want to be the high elf version of Zoe? Do you just want to be like a high elf Zoe is driving? (laughs) Like, (laughs) I think it is a little bit more interesting if she doesn't just become essentially what she was prior to this. But as an adult, like it's not just she has like the super saiyan hair and everything still. Uh, I like the idea better that it's. Something not, I guess, like completely arbitrary to what she was before, but it's not like she doesn't have the same like uh, exact uh, features as she did before. Like maybe her hair color is different now or maybe her uh, facial structure is a little bit different, you know. So that, yeah, they cast a different actor Mm -hmm. rather than find like her older sister. Exactly. So there's an uncanniness to I like it. She like you look in the mirror and it's like, I'm in there, but where? (laughs) What does this mean? Everyone's just like, I like the first Darren better. I like the first Zoe a little bit better, you know? Oh, <laughs> this, this is the Christopher Eccleston. This, 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 is what, yeah, this is what happened after they temporarily casted uh, a dragon as Zoe, and then they quit due to not liking the director for some reason. I don't know. The, the issue they had is they didn't realize dragons grow up so fast. It's like Walton <laughs> Lost. You couldn't base... Uh, such an important character and someone who just grows up that fast, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, real talk, I would have loved for you to have been a dragon much longer, but that <laughs> is the pitfall of the wild magic table. Like The pitfall or the strength? Both. Like This has been an amazing season. Like I, I'm intensely in love with this mechanic. <laughs> I, I'd never want to do it again. <laughs> but for this time, it's brought me a ton of joy. The problem is that I can't control it. So, yes. mm-hmm. so uh, the cantrip that zoe now has uh, because she is a high elf is create bonfire which allows you to create a flame essentially within a five foot cube anywhere around you and it's a concentration spell so it kind of just remains there um until for at least a minute and it can deal damage or provide heat and warmth you know mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's versatile seems something that would have been really useful last session when we were all freezing inside of uh, the avant guard <laughs> headquarters but what can you do I mean, I would like you to to start a bonfire in headquarters because there's a tradition on Dice Funk, which is every season there's a fire in a library. <laughs> so if you burned all of Winnie's books, that would have been very on brand. Oh, that would have been terrible, though. Oh, poor Winnie. Um, so you guys arrive just outside of Wolf's place. I'm sorry you have to hear my voice for a little bit longer, but let me set up this scene. Um, the plan is Veltari and Dor are going to go talk to Wolf. Uh, Dora in mist form as backup, while Zoe and Roland uh, stay a little bit farther away so they aren't spotted, and they're there for like the second line of backup. To be clear, if something pops off, it's going to take them a couple rounds to get there. So the trade-off of this is Wolf trusts Veltari, but it might break bad because she's here under false pretenses to interrogate him. And trolls are incredibly dangerous. They regenerate their injuries and they're super strong. And you know, his animal totem is a purple worm, which is like a full on boss encounter for a team of level 15 adventurers. Yeah. It's like that scene at the beginning of Inglorious Bastards, <laughs> where you're going to have this conversation knowing at any time Knowing at any time the Nazis could shoot through the floorboards. So my my vague plan is try and keep on as good terms as, po- as possible. If I have any suspicion it's going to pop off, I'm just going to be like, right, lock you down with my mystical floaty light cube and hope that that buys time for the party to turn up. That's my vague plan going in is like incapacitate, don't try and fight. Yeah, I'm sure that betrayal won't crush his Aww. soul after he finally found Aww. a friend. Yeah, well, you know, if... I'm only going to do this if he's starting to attack me, and at that point, the friendship's probably broken down anyway, so... (laughs) You promised. Yeah, and I'm going to maintain my promise. I'm going to go back and play with him. I wanted to be his friend, too. He just wouldn't let me. We'll see how this goes. So, right, up I go. I walk to Wolf. I'm floating. 
Dora, you don't have to make any checks or anything because you're you've done enough misting to know to not be conspicuous. I assume, unless you want to do like mist stunts and like spell some stuff, <laughs> just like <laughs> bump into people's faces. Yeah, do some sky riding. I might bump into people on the way there, <laughs> but I'm not gonna bump into him because I don't want him to kill me and eat me. You're such a little shit. <laughs> That's fine. If he catches you, I am just gonna say the popo turned invisible to track me, and you're gonna be fucked. <laughs> All right. He sees you coming and says, um, oh, howdy. <laughs> you're back already? Yeah, I'm back. I, I had some free time and thought I'd come see how you're doing. Uh, I'm doing all right. How was the tater? It was good. Uh, I I would love to have some more sometime. Like one was like, I, I shared it with some, some other people and uh, it, it wasn't a huge amount to go around, but we did some really nice thin cut fries with them. And uh, oh, super nice. You make re- you do really good taters. Wait, uh. Other people like potatoes too? Yeah, I'll, you know, at some point I will try and introduce you to some people, but I shared them with some some people and they liked them, <gasps> so, you know. More friends. Oh. More friends. We will try and sort you more friends. Um, So, you know, I, I said we'd come down. There was some stuff you wanted to try to see if it'd be fun. <gasps> you want to play with me? Yeah, what do, what, what do we want to do first? <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> um, roll athletics to play f- <laughs> to play tag with Wolf the Troll. Roll to not break your arm. <laughs> I just want to say Dora is really sad that she can't be playing tag right now. Five. Oh god. Oh no. Oh no. Wolf rolled a twenty-four. So oh no. Veltari goes running off, and with his enormous legs, he catches up in like two strides, reaches <laughs> out, and just like blasts you off your feet accidentally. He he is roughhousing like a son of a gun. Is he at least enjoying it? He is having the time of his life. He is like a golden retriever. <laughs> Damn those Aussie rule tag, you know. <laughs> yeah. He plays full contact blood sport tag. Oh, okay, Wolf, Wolf, uh, I'm going to suggest this one is fun. I do not have the legs to keep up with you on this sport, so this might be one for the when we find other friends that are a bit faster than me pile. <laughs> How about this? I'll, I'll be on foot, and you can be on Mr. Worm. Oh, Mr. Worm? Who's Mr. Worm? As you say that, uh, the ghost of a giant purple worm, although it's white, not purple because it's a ghost, uh, starts rising up from the ground underneath you, taking on materiality as it does so. And you are basically surfing a 10 foot wide <laughs> worm from Dune, which is exactly where D&D stole it <laughs> from. Oh, God. Do I have to do a roll to surf the worm? <laughs> I am insistent on you surfing this worm. What what do, what do I have to roll to see how successfully I, 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 I surf the world? Animal handling. Uh, what is my animal hand? Oh, plus five. Handle this oh, worm. 25, God. natural 20. <laughs> Did she just crit the worm? <laughs> I crit the surf worm. All right, have you guys seen the film Point Break? <laughs> oh, no. This is pretty good right here. So we're now playing tag while I'm surfing the the potentially the boss encounter. You not only hang 10, you hang natural 20. <laughs> oh god. Okay, th- this is helping me keep up speech with you wolf. Um when when do when should you get this worm? Oh, after I talked to you guys uh yesterday I I was feeling good, full of confidence and energy and I went and saw that witch. And uh, she she gave him to me. She let me have uh, this kind of ghost friend. Oh, is that another friend then? Yeah. Uh, I got you, and I got the mysterious potato people, and I got Mr. Worm, and I guess uh, my secret friend. Your secret friend? It's a secret. (laughs) Is is this a... uh, I'm I'm sorry, I don't mean to pry. Is this a a new friend, or...? No, I mean, we talked about him last time. I, I told you. Oh, is this uh, our friend Garrick? Yeah. Oh, how's he doing? I, I have I haven't seen him lately. Uh, I met him uh, on the night of the party. Uh, that skeleton came by and gave me an invitation, and I I I was too scared to go. I got what uh what's that? Their uh, social anxiety. It's a fancy fancy word for uh, I'm scared of being around a lot of people. Aww. It's it's okay. I I I I get the same stuff. Um. 
how did how did you meet him? Because like I've we we met him at that party, and we've we we, we or uh, some people I know met him at the party, and he's really hard to to find to spend time with. Yeah, I don't know where he lives. I just I ran into him. I was going for a walk to clean my head uh, over by the that house with the broken roof, and I ran into him and uh, we got to talking, and he was like the first person I can remember who talked to me like a, like a normal person. That's really nice. And I gave him the invitation so he could go. It's, it sounds like it sounds like he had a really nice time at the party, from what I hear. So, like, that was a really nice thing you did. Thank you. Nah, it's. I mean, it's the least I could do. Uh, he he was nice to me, and uh, after that, for a while, uh, every night I would go to sleep and I would dream about this star. And he he like reaches down and holds the amulet that he's been wearing in every scene <laughs> that I've mentioned, mm-hmm. but no one's ever asked about. <laughs> and you see. It looks like a weird, fancy filigree star. And he says, this reminds me of him. So I went to the lilies and I had them make me this. And uh, it makes me feel like sh- like strong and I can talk to people like you. And it works because now we're friends. That's 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 really that's really nice to hear, Wolf. Um, and while I'm assuming at this point, like we've stopped, we're not having this like slow conversation while still riding the, uh, the, the sandworm. <laughs> I was picturing you just... Sp- as surfing around him in circles. Okay, okay. Um, at this point, I'm gonna get down. I'm gonna give you know the worm a nice pat and and get down gently to the ground, and just you know, uh, walk up to Wolf and just be like, "So, tag was fun. Were there any other fun games you wanted to try today?" Uh, yeah. You want to draw something? Yeah, we can do drawing. I'm not very good at drawing, but you know, the fun is in the trying. What What do you want to try and draw? Uh, I want to draw. Bad things happening to to dwarves. <laughs> okay, how about this? I'll try and draw the dwarves, and then you can draw the bad things to them, and together we'll make a picture. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I made an I made an art roll for Wolf. He got negative two. <laughs> where's where's art roll? Is that just do performance, then balance it out with the dexterity check? How much does your passion balance out with your actual uh, technical skills? Uh, my dex modifier is zero, so... So eight for technical skill, and then 17 for your, your flourish to it. So, like, you know, they're, they're, they're mediocre... Um, they're mediocre little creatures, but, like, I'm, you know... I'm giving you all I've got. I, I, I look like I'm in an anime trying to, like, do the big drawing competition <laughs> at the end of the season. Your your Rohan? Yes! <laughs> your Rohan Kisabe drawing on the thing, your arms flying everywhere. Yep. Yes! Lauren's so excited about Rohan, she clipped the podcast audio. I love him so much. <laughs> and his little crop tops. So, yeah, I'm basically, basically him. <laughs> Alright, so you draw a bunch of dwarves, your technique is crude, but there's a lot of heart. And he draws just like rocks falling on them and arrows spearing them, just like, oh. real simple geometric shapes. Like, he just draws a circle and he's like, that. That's a rock. It's gonna smash his head. Like how you draw? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, how about, <gasps> you know what you could do a bit of drawing? Wallop City. They're all going to Wallop City. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah. So he draws a bunch of rectangles. He's like, all right, these is the buildings. This is City Hall, Wallop City. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, this is so good. I wish I had some way we could like, keep this as a thing but we i think we kind of just did this in the dirt so it's <laughs> you know it's not gonna stay here forever but that's okay because we'll just have to do another one some other time it's an excuse to do more art did you enjoy that <laughs> of course yeah it was good fun oh, uh i'm gonna need to sit down for a second i'm all i'm all i'm all exercised and and funned out <laughs> I, <laughs> so how long do you guys think this took? Because Dora can stay in mist form for an hour, so I like that like Veltari strings us along a little too long, and so it starts to get to like where she needs to get the critical information on a clock before her cover before Theodora's cover is blown. Yeah, please. By the way, have you like committed a murder recently? Just minor small chat stuff, you know? So Wolf. That's me. <laughs> I I would love if we could get all of your friends together sometime so that we could, like, just have a nice potato party. We could just, like, see what we can do with potatoes and do some stuff. I I know how to get a hold of, like, most of the people I would invite. Um, 
Do you know how we can get a hold of uh, Garrick to come along? He said he doesn't get out much, but he sometimes watches like the town and tries to find like ways to help people. Mm. He like he doesn't like he doesn't like bullies. Yeah, there's. I don't think anyone likes bullies, really, do they? They're uh, they're never good. I mean, there's a whole building full of them in this town. Which building's that? Uh, the bar. Oh, yeah, that's. You know, this is going to sound a weird question. I, I, I don't know Garrick that well. Lyra was one of the bullies who was who was bullying you for money before, if I'm right, wasn't wasn't she? Yeah, she came by like every couple of days and like tear my arms off. Mm, and she 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 died um, recently. She was she was hit with a lot of ice magic, which, as best I know, is what Garrick uses. Um, look, I'm I'm not trying to say that this isn't someone you can be friends with. Like, I get why he would do it, but do you think maybe Garrick might have gotten rid of Lyra for you? That sounds like him. He's a hero. He. Take out them bullies. Do you know? Do you know who else he might be planning to to take out? I mean, do you know any other bullies? I guess like uh, who the the popo. Yeah, I can I can see him trying to take out the popo. He uh, I I walked I walked past the popo's place this morning and it was covered in ice. So I I, I guess he's already he's already gone for them. Well, I mean, they must have done something. He wouldn't just attack them for no reason. Well. They they were bullying you. I know that much. Yeah, and they they were trying to kidnap you. It's just a bunch of big bullies, and the heroes got to stop the bullies. Thank you a lot for telling me about your secret friend. I I really appreciate that. I know that it was a, a thing that you know was a secret for you, and I really appreciate your trusting me that much. It it means a lot. Of course, a uh, friend share. That's that's what we do, right? I think. Yeah. No. You you have got friendship down you are pretty good at it um before i before i go um look feel free to say no if this is an odd request do you do you mind if i take a look at the at the at the amulet you've got because it it looks really nice i'm i promise i won't take it anywhere i just want to have a look and just have a look at it see what it's it's like because it's it looks really nicely made sure uh here you go uh he hands it over And it is a little crude. Like, this isn't the kind of quality jewelry that you guys, like, saw at Sylvia's when she got paid in, like, really fine custom jewelry. This seems like something that Penny just, like, had another piece of jewelry lying around and, like, reshaped it to sell it to a wolf in order to get him under debt. Yeah. Uh, But, yeah, if you had asked me in the first, like, 14 episodes what wolf's amulet looked like, I would have said of a star. Yeah. You guys know it is actually a snowflake. Um, from holding it, am I able to tell if it is in any way magically imbued? No, it is not. It does, it, there, you have no reason to think it's magic. In fact, you think maybe like Penny told him it was just to like jack up the price or something. But no, this is just a crude reenactment of just a thing that Wolf saw in his dreams. Yeah. Because the symbol was projected into his mind. <laughs> Okay, I think I think I have everything I need for my hypothesis of what's going on, but I'm I, I'm gonna get out of here before uh, before we have like the demisting issue goes <laughs> on and before we end up in a combat encounter. I think we got a good amount, and I'm gonna just be like, so uh, look, I've I've got to go, Wolf, but I can't promise like when it'll be, but I definitely want to come back and hang out again sometime. This was really fun. Oh, thank you. I, I'm glad you had fun. I was I was worried, but. Uh... If I run into Garrick, I'll tell him that you guys want to hang out and we'll we'll do something. Thank you. Um did did you get the jam I sent? Oh yeah. Uh I've been saving it for a special occasion. I uh I asked I asked the person who made it to uh try and get some that would pair well with uh taters, so hopefully it, it works for you. Um Who was that that made the jam? Sorry, that's <laughs> <laughs> Uh it was it was uh I I'd, I'd never met I'd never met him before. He's a a, a jellyfish jellyfish guy. Mmm. Does Wolf know Winifred? <laughs> hmm. Does he know that Winifred is actually the king of the popo? Well, this this is why I tried to lead my like, ah, oh, I'd never met him before. He just bumped into someone that did jams. Roll me a deception to to have that pulled off in such a way as that he doesn't think this is worth pursuing. Eleven. Okay, he just had the best day of his life. 
<laughs> so above average is going to cut it today. He's a little suspicious, but not enough that he doesn't want to make this awkward now. Yeah. So he says, uh, oh, oh, a jellyfish. Oh, okay. Yeah, this town's weird. Yeah, it is a bit weird. Um, Yeah, I, I got to go, but I will come back. I'll come see you again soon, okay? All right, bye. Bye. And I get the hell out of there. <laughs> Dora mists away as fast as her little mist body can take her. Usain Bolt <laughs> out of there. All right, so you guys want to regroup? Uh, I will, w- real quick, just remind you guys that after you had your ice cream party, Sylvia did your reading, and you, you know, there's one person left. The warden still, yeah. So if you guys want to regroup first or go right there, go ahead. Um, I think regroup first, because I have some thoughts to share with the group, I think. So, I I, I, t- I talked to Wolf. Um, Wolf is definitely very tied in with Garrick the Great. Um, Garrick has done something that today seems to be somewhat of a, a theme of discussion. Um, Garrick is very good at taking people that want something and giving it to them, and in this case, giving Wolf friendship. Um, when Wolf sleeps, he sees a vision of the snowflake. I have to wonder, does is this something to do with perhaps Garrick is inhabiting Wolf's body in the night or something? Like, Wolf, while he sleeps, is in some way tied to Garrick. On top of that, the people that Garrick is going after are people who have wronged Wolf. And that seems to be a common theme. First we had Lyra, then us because the popo, as it were, you know, were hassling Wolf. Uh, well, to be clear about this, that scene, he didn't go after you guys. He was walking towards a house and you jumped him and he never, <laughs> atta- he never attacked you. Yeah, but he attacked our house. After that encounter. He went in your house and then property damage ensued. Okay, well, Wolf, when he is sleeping, is seeing this very vivid symbol and i i don't personally know why someone would see a symbol like that in their sleep i wonder if it is wolf wolf's body is being used in the night but it's the same thing that winifred saw when he reached out to garrick's mind yeah like this is this is what i'm thinking is if this symbol is in wolf's mind while he sleeps and trying to read garrick's mind in the night, because we've only ever encountered him at night, causes this symbol to be seen that is in Wolf's mind while he sleeps. I'm on the thought process that this is that Wolf is Garrick in some way. We need to monitor if if Wolf is sticking around all night or not. That's that's my suspicion. To be clear, Laura, you're accusing me of having a character named Wolf who undergoes a transformation at night. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. All right, well, that's, that says something about how you see me. Do you guys want to go talk to the angel? All right, let's do this. Let's do this indeed. I want to note something. Uh, Zoe will go along with you, but not actually inside of the church. Okay, so you're going to stand outside the sacrum and just shoot coins around it? Uh, yeah, well, I was actually, I, I did want to ask that. Am I still shooting out coins uncontrollably? Absolutely. So the entire scene with Roland and uh, Veltari and the tension between them just in the background, Zoe's going off like a slot machine that just hit jackpot. I mean, out the window res- for respect. Respectfully, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Just to honor the recently departed. <laughs> Make it rain. <laughs> Dropping a couple coins on the sidewalk for my homies. <laughs> Pour one out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you guys heading over to the sacrum, the big white tower. Dora's gonna gather up, like, all the coins that she can, by the way. So now if there's a scene where you have to run for your life, I'll remember that. Because gold is heavy. I still have a spell slot. It just means that if we're being chased by something, we could throw them on the ground and they'll slip and slide all over it like them silly raptor things in uh, the Godzilla movie. Yeah. Gold is the same color as banana peels, therefore (laughs) it's as slippery as banana peels. Exactly. That's just physics. That is just physics right there, yes. (laughs) <laughs> so Zoe stays outside. The rest of you go inside the sacrum, the main room on the first floor. Uh, he is not actually there. Uh, Dora's going to go, hey! Shh. <laughs> 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 All right. Roland's going to like slap, slap a hand over Dor- uh, Dora's mouth when she starts to yell. Hmm. 
rolling the librarian. I guess I won't do my plan of thaumaturgy and shout then. Um, after a moment, you guys hear the sound of rattling chains and unlocking locks, and the door in the back opens, and Warden Light walks in in his purple robe and looking very austere and important and powerful. And he says, Oh, Brother Hawklight, avant garde, how are you this morning? Dora waves emphatically because her mouth is covered. <laughs> We, we've uh, we've had a day. Ah, it's it's only just begun. Sh- hopefully, uh, the rest of it will be full of blessings. <laughs> yeah, we can only hope. Um, so I'm I'm gonna cut right to the to the to the heart of this. You're aware that there's someone running around town trying to kill people or inadvertently killing people, right? I, that seems like the kind of thing you'd be on top of. Uh, yes, I have hired you to find a murderer. So yeah, yeah. So here here is our deal. Wolf is in some way connected to our killer, who goes by Garrick the Great, who is in some way connected to a wizard who lived on the outskirts of town in a dingy, broken-down magic house. We suspect whoever's using that magic now doesn't actually have magic. They can't control it. They're using devices. Some way heavily tied to Wolf. Some tarot cards told us to come here. What do you make of this? Uh, You actually, his expression gets, like, real serious. I mean, he's always kind of like no fun allowed, but like there's a gravity to this that I don't know if any of you have ever seen before when you mention the wizard on the outside of town and he Mm. kind of stops listening to the rest of your sentence, frankly. And he says, what does Azrael have to do with this? It appears that, well, there may be a connection between what's happening right now and Azrael. Azrael has been in prison for as long as the rest of you have even considered hunting bounties. Uh, Azriel's house was full of instructions on how to build magical devices, and our killer is using magical devices that match those in Azriel's books. So there's that as a connection. Those books are useless to anyone but geniuses of the highest caliber, and I destroyed the devices he left behind. Well, someone has a thing that makes things cold. Someone is running around the town... Freezing people seemingly without control, using devices to rewind time, uh, to... What else, what else were they doing? Uh, you saw him turn into smoke, and you also... And the mask he wears is magic. Yeah, he, he doesn't seem to be in control of this magic, but he's using items from those books. He must have had some hidden away before I took him. If someone has got their hands on them, then, well, before... I had to take Azrael down personally. The people I sent in before that did not accomplish their goals. We were close last night. We very, very almost took whoever had those devices down. Um, we know what we're going in if we run into them again, but we still have some questions that are probably worth answering before we try and face this person again. So this is the other mystery that somehow ties in. When Wolf goes to sleep, he sees through his entire night a snowflake in his mind. And when we tried to, re- when when uh, Winifred tried to read the mind of the person who is using these devices, he saw that snowflake in his mind. Powerful magics can imprint on people. That's miracles and signs, uh, saints' images embossed on toast. It happens. <laughs> Um, Especially those who aren't guarded against magic, like a telepath who is very open to the world, or not to be cruel, but someone simpler, like like a troll, for instance, would perhaps be more susceptible to that kind of thing. I don't know all the information, but it sounds like if this person has Asriel's devices, you can't beat them in a fair fight. They are simply too well-equipped. What I did, I mean, not to be... (laughs) <laughs> unhumble but i had to, t- to ambush Azrael, take him by surprise to, to have a chance of taking him in that was our uh our play last night my point is you're gonna have to find out who he is under the mask and then ambush that person before he could become garrick the great and fight back one one more question i guess is you're aware of all of the uh, totem creatures that uh, have recently been attached to various people in town. Yes, uh, 
I was concerned at first, but apparently it seems to be a symbiotic relationship. If as long as both parties are not being harmed, I have no problem with it. Yeah. Do you know anyone, anyone else in town who would be powerful enough to grant one of these totems to someone? This kind of magic is not in my wheelhouse, unfortunately, but if my understanding of the subject is correct, it would have to be someone like the witch who is giving them out or someone who is above even Lady Nim and myself. Frankly, it seems to be the purview of a god, perhaps. Anyone else got any questions? I can save it for another time, if it's not prudent, but some more information about the Zazrael would be possibly useful. It's it's impossible for Azrael to have any direct influence over the events of today. No, I took care of Azrael personally. As to the specifics of his devices, I could not tell you their their inner workings. I could not tell you a lot of things about him. Azrael is not even his name. This is what he called himself, but I asked him if that was the name he was born with, and he could not tell me the true answer. And uh, I can tell these things, but he gave a lot of answers like that. He said all kinds of things when I brought him in, and some of them were even true. But the only important question was, did you kill that man? And he said, yes. So I locked him away. Who did he kill? Some, some old man. I didn't know him well. He came from so far away, somewhere in the north. I cannot remember his name. I apologize. That's, okay. That's completely fine. Uh, thank you for that. There are few people left in town who remember Azrael. The Hawthorns, the Lilies, myself. For someone to have gotten their hands on his devices, they must have known they existed and where to find them. Azrael's at the heart of this, I can feel it. Perhaps... This is drastic. Perhaps you would like to speak with him yourself? Yes! It would be the easiest way to get to the bottom of this. I'm secretly kind of pumped to visit Ghost Jail. <laughs> uh, I do not offer this lightly. As I've told Brother Hawklight innumerable times, once you enter my care, you cannot leave until you are reformed. Well, you'd be entering his imprisonment, so you would not be able to leave until he is reformed. <sighs> hmm... From the many long hours Brother Hawklight and myself have spent debating the nature of justice, he seems convinced that the spirit can undergo such change. It seems like a perfect opportunity to put that to the test, does it not? I think so. I'm only to take on this burden. Roland, I'm willing to, to, to do this for you. This, I, I, this... I don't even know where this is coming from, but I don't regret what I did. But I can hopefully go some way to making up for what I did, if you'll let me. If I go in there, I would feel I would have the best mind to, a duty to judge whether or not a reformation has occurred. However, my biggest failing is that I've never been very pers persuasive. I've never been good with words. I've been good with strategies. I've been good with tactics. I've been good with adjudication, but... Look, I'm gonna d put it to you this way. If you go into a jail as someone that talks about the rights of, you know, whether someone's reformed, you're never gonna get through to someone who's been locked in, in ghost prison. <laughs> I reckon that I've got a chance going in there, because screw, screw it, I've just done the first nice thing to, for someone that I've probably ever done. Give me a crack at him. <laughs> Roland then looks over to the warden and, and then states, In this case, what matters is whether the, the spirit of Azrael is able to demonstrate it has become reformed, correct? Your use of spirit leads me to believe that you think he is dead. I, I assure you he is not. I'm fairly certain that he is not dead, as mm. you, you seem to be the one, you seem to hold at least enough optimism in your heart to not slay them yourselves, but merely sustain them indefinitely to grant them a chance at reformation. 
He waves a hand, and you actually hear behind him the door unlock, and you hear the rattling of chains, and then you see chains creeping out from behind that door, carrying a mirror, uh, one you've seen numerous times at this point. I start walking towards it, and I just say to Roland, you finish finish this quest, you find out what's going on with Garrick. If this person is as unredeemable as, 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 uh, as it sounds like, you don't deserve to be stuck here forever. If anyone deserves to be here, it's probably me. And I just keep walking towards the mirror. Uh, Dora's gonna give thumbs up, but I'm gonna make it very clear that she is not going to offer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something she would do. As the mirror is brought by just, like, sentient animated chains over to Warden Light, he finishes his kind of thought to Roland. He says, these mirrors, these prisons, these reformation tools were made by a person who I trust more than anyone in the world. And the magic inside of them is made to only release those who have changed their evil ways and who can be reintegrated into society. So if you, you truly have the righteousness inside you that you believe you do, you may be the only hope in getting out of there with whatever secrets Azrael has. If someone enters and they may require reformation of their own, and even if they enter and of their own volition and were not the original inhabitants, they too will be trapped until they are reformed, then, based on what you just said. No. Each mirror is an individualized palette of reformation. This one is Azrael's. So, to reemerge again, only he would need to be reformed. It would not be just if multiple people could be trapped for the sins of one. Yeah. I, unless anyone's stopping me, I'm still heading for that mirror. It may work best if you and I both were in there. I, I can't, I can't stop you coming with me, Roland. I, I don't think that you deserve to be trapped in here if we can't reform this person's sins, but I'm willing to take this burden, but if you want to come, I can't stop you. Roland whispers to her, if the only way for me to convince the warden that reformation is possible should be by my hand, and it should be through my actions. But I can't do this alone. Consider this step one to me making up for the shit I pulled on you. <laughs> In front of you, the mirror, which is being hefted by these chains at about like chest height, starts to glow. And Warden Light gestured towards it after, as if to say, go on then. Roland calls out over to, uh, to Dora. Let Zoe know that we might be a while. But try to continue the investigation as well as you can, okay? I have a message for you both as well. If I don't come back from this, tell the barmaid that she was my favorite. <laughs> Will do. I'm a saluter. <laughs> I salute back. I'll take care of Winnie for you. Roland Zen's gonna whisper softly, Pineapple. Aww. Hey, it's your boy. I hope nothing bad's happening. I'm in a great mood today. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, how's your investigation? We might have a way to advance the investigation, but it's going to require me being silent for a while, Winnie. Oh, going deep undercover? We're going to try to talk to one of the persons that the warden has in his captivity. <gasps> and we will be in there until we can demonstrate that the person in question has been reformed. Jail quest. <laughs> Indeed. Um, <laughs> Veltari will be with me as well, so just keep an eye out for, for Zoe and Dora and make sure to help them as well as you've always had so far. I'll do my best. Thank you, Winnie. Good luck. This is Roland. Over and out. All right. So, with all of your goodbyes said, do you guys reach out and touch the glowing mirror? Yep. Mm -hmm. Theodora, you watch as the two tallest members of your team uh, touch a weird magical enchanted mirror and instantly blink out of existence, and they are gone. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the chains kind of place the mirror in Warden Light's outstretched hands, and he just like looks at you and says, uh, 
Is there anything else, Sister Theodora? I do not know how long it will be. Uh, no, uh, uh, this is weird. I've never been alone with you. Uh, <laughs> just tell me when they're back. Bye! I'm gonna run out to get Zoe. <laughs> okay. You run away, leaving Warden Light slightly confused inside the sacrum. He has the mirror. Hey, Zoe, shit, what, shit went down. Uh, hold on, I need to find a word that rhymes with happened. <laughs> 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 Crappened. <laughs> and bappened, but that's not a real word. Crappy rhymes are still rhymes. Let's keep this in mind. Yeah, frankly, I don't have the power to make you do good rhymes. Only rhymes. <laughs> What's up? I don't know what I'm going to finish this with. Buttercup. <laughs> nice. Good job. Uh, so I'm in charge because I'm the oldest, technically. <laughs> Oh, then I gotta tell you what happened. Oh god, we've left the kids unsupervised. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are grounded. This I like to think that this scene just starts with vacation playing over top of it, <laughs> like all the 90s movies and everything. Running around town eating ice cream and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Things setting fire occasionally. Eating so much of Winnie's jam that they feel sick and then have to sleep it off. <laughs> oh yeah, like we have the comedically huge bellies as we're like laying down like, oh. Oh shit, and we're definitely visiting Ishmael. Oh. So are you guys literally just going to goof off until your parents get back? That's a totally viable option. I just want to make sure there isn't anything else. Outside of us going after any possible lead on Garrick it's himself, I mean. You could just use this as downtime, just like a like the downtime up. Ep- downtime episodes except without the level gain if you guys want to just fashion show because she's bigger now <laughs> and she needs clothes okay we can do a fa- we can do a fashion montage i guess <laughs> if you guys want to roll for fashion but what would, what, what would i roll for fashion charisma 10 that's not high 24 so he's so he doesn't get this new form <laughs> Okay, so you guys do that scene where one of you's in the dressing room and one of you sits outside and you come out in different outfits and you shake your head three times, but on the fourth one, it's good? Yeah, and something really happy is playing in the background. Vacation, we already said. Oh, it's still vacation? <laughs> yeah, it's still vacation. It just keeps going on a loop till we eventually get tired of it. And then we have to play something sad, like Joy Division or something. <laughs> you, you look at Zoe's iTunes and it's just 100 copies of Vacation. <laughs> She's like, I went through every 90s movie OST and purchased the song from there. That way I could have 90 different versions of it. And there's a couple of subtle differences where there's like slightly different edits in a couple different movies. Yeah, there's one with the preamble by Tommy before the uh, Rugrats movie. Is there like a club mix? Like, <laughs> I am positive there must be. <laughs> there absolutely is a dubstep EDM version of Vacation. <laughs> oh shit, rave at the avant-garde headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> um i'm gonna end this episode with the first thing they see inside the mirror but if you guys if you guys have anything you actually want to do in this time like a scene or somebody you want to talk to that we can set up for next time now is the time to let me know i think one of the things that we we should definitely look into i know i know that they're on probably the best part of like getting the conclusion to everything with garrick but before they went in we knew like we had had an idea for something else too which was just to stake out yeah, I was gonna see if you wanted to stake out with me. Oh my god! So I think that yeah, I think that's that's where we should be going is is Wolf's place and trying to stake it out. I mean, it might not end up with anything significant happening as a result, but okay, roll survival to set up a stake out, both of you. Oh god, am I am I still shooting out coins? Can I like <laughs> tie bags around her hands or something? I think the bags will just explode, won't they? Eventually, it's true. Oh. I want to say, oh, I rolled a 19. And also, some of those clothes I made during the fashion montage were stakeout clothes. <laughs> oh, I got a three. Okay. So you guys uh, sit on a hill far away from Wolf where you can kind of see down at his house. But unfortunately, you're making so many coins that they basically start a huge pile at the top of the hill. And at some point, it avalanches down. <laughs> so he probably knows you, you guys are there, even though Dora is killing it on the stakeout. Here's the important thing that happens while you guys are kind of overlooking his place is you guys watch him dig up potatoes. You watch him pick his nose. You watch him throw mud at passing birds. <laughs> <laughs> he just kind of does boring troll stuff for the whole time. But while you're sitting there, uh, presumably, you know, kicking your little feet up, eating some snacks, talking about boys. I don't know, whatever. And girls. <laughs> uh, Theodora, you hear a voice and it says, 
corrupt the youth or lose my gifts. Man, apparently getting Zoe high isn't good enough. You say that, and then as if in response, you hear again, Corrupt the youth. Corrupt the youth. Corrupt the youth. And it's like, he's done waiting. It's it's like this sweet dance remixed version of it. <laughs> it's, it's been months like in game at this point since he assigned you this. Okay. <laughs> That's it? I guess so. Does it have to be this youth? Can it be a different youth? He is not specific. No, it does not. But you have free time. Hey, Zoe. What's Claire up to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do I form a rhyme out of we're fucked? <laughs> <laughs> something, something, something sucked. Blah, 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 blah. We're fucked. That's a romantic one. Oh, I don't know. She's probably making a buck. It doesn't matter much. We're both pretty fucked. The rhymes aren't great. <laughs> right. I had two really good ones and the opportunity never came up to use them. Mm-hmm. All right. So are you guys going to head over to Tarsus to talk to Claire? Uh, Dora's going to be like, I'm going now. Bye. <laughs> uh, where uh, the twa? Um, twa, we, twa? I just had to form a rhyme out of her uh, brambles as she i guess has to chase after her yeah i mean the secret loophole is you could just make noises that rhyme you'd be like i don't think we should go over there blah, 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 there <laughs> <laughs> yeah that sounds bad a, b- 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 a bear i don't think we should go over there i like to really pet bears <laughs> i think also zoe's getting really tired of having coins shoot out of her hands mm-hmm. and as she's like chasing after dora she's just gonna reach a moment of frustration where she's just going to like p- stop and just shoot a fireball straight into the air, <laughs> hoping that maybe that changes it. Okay, so this is definitely in character, because the last time you had this effect, because this is a kind of class of magic effect, like the syrup, it was cleared up when you casted another spell, and it does this time. Uh, you melt the gold coins in transit as you fire a fireball into the sky, and it explodes above you like a firework. Roll on the wild magic table. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Yeah, and Dora's gonna say, sweet pyrotechnics! 18. Mmm. Oh, geez. <laughs> what was that noise? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the fireball explodes over you, and nothing seems to happen from Zoe's perspective. You just, like, look at your hands. They've stopped spewing gold, and you're like, sweet. Hey, I got away with one. Nice. <laughs> and then you just run after Theodora. Theodora, you see Zoe running towards you, and she's, like, catching up. And there's just something about Zoe's face that you just find extremely punchable all of a sudden. (laughs) Zoe, I don't know what you did, but God, I really want to punch you in the face right now. Why me? I don't know. Your face looks real punchable. Can I punch it? (laughs) Please let me punch it. (laughs) It's almost as if you have suffered a massive charisma drop. (gasps) Oh, Oh, no. no. (laughs) You're... Exuding an aura of just total unlikability. So like me in real life, basically. No. <laughs> um, but you're not making coins happen anymore. Do I still speak in rhyme? Uh, yeah, you're still speaking in rhyme. You, it doesn't. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be a replaceable one. Can't win them all. <laughs> uh, I don't know what's happened, but I think I have a hunch. But for the moment, Dor, I don't want to be punched. <laughs> Okay. To be clear, this is charisma ch- uh, skill checks uh, and not spell casting. You still can. Oh. oh, so my scores have gone lower, but actually, it's just minus ten to intimidation, persuasion, and deception, and performance. I guess I should make her roll persuasion to have me not punch her. <laughs> no, that's not how that works. That's <laughs> no, I know. no, I know. <laughs> I got a zero. <laughs> you punched. I crit failed it with a negative one. I was kidding, but now I have to punch you. So, Lauren, do you punch her in the face? I rolled a zero. You have to. Yeah, I punch her, but I, I like her, so it's gentle. <laughs> okay. So the last scene of uh, Team Kids on their way to the bar <laughs> is <laughs> Theodore punching Zoe in the jaw in a friendly way. Gently. So cut back to Team Parents, who have just been transported inside a magical mirror prison. And the first thing you guys see is blackness. 
You're just greeted by just infinite blackness. And then you see twinkling points of light. And you realize they're stars. And then suddenly, you can hear things. And then you can smell things. It's as if all of your senses come online, one after another. And then you hear the the low murmuring of people talking around you. And there's people walking past you. And you notice that the blackness and the stars you see are on the other side of glass. And you're just looking out through glass into space as people kind of mill around behind you. If nothing else, Roland, uh, sticking with this team is getting me to see some some interesting things. <laughs> Certainly not bored with you, Lord Around. Roland's going to roll religion to see if you can get a basic understanding of what type of plane or place we're in. 27. So very good. So you look around, you're in some kind of hallway and people are walking by. You've never seen any room like this. Everything's made out of like really clean, pristine white material you've never seen. It's very strange. And you turn around and you see this weird glass wall with space on the other side. Mm. And you're looking around and you see just the infinite blackness of space. And you're looking around this and then you see an enormous column of rainbow light. The aurora, yeah. Yeah, you see the aurora that is around Ilium just projecting through this blackness, which is filled with stars. And with a 27, you roll religion, but even though you have no frame of reference for what you're seeing, it is pretty clear that you are in something that is traveling through the void of space. And outside this window you see that the aurora that surrounds Ilium extends up into space and into infinity. And it goes from as far as you can see in one direction to as far as you can see in the other. And it is clear that one of those ends is Earth, but it is so far away that you cannot see it. I always wanted to be an astronaut. (laughs) He looks back into the rest of the room and is just people or they like sort of ghostly shapes of people or what you see these people who are walking behind you just kind of like commuting in this weird wherever you are this room in space and you notice they don't have faces they're like human shapes but they're featureless as they mill past you you can't even tell like what species they are they're vaguely humanoid but they're like weird and gray and fuzzy like static and you can't just you can't really tell what you're looking at so much. This whole place has an air of artificiality to it. It's unreal, like a like a dream. Can I roll perception to try and get an idea of where we should be going in here? Sure. 30! <laughs> Nine, natural one. Great. So, <laughs> hold on. Veltari, crit, and Roland botched. Interesting. So you guys are in this weird hallway full of faceless people... And you're clearly in space. You guys wouldn't have the word spaceship, but Mm. you're in a spaceship. And you start walking down the hallway in opposite directions, kind of scoping. And you both reach the end of wherever you're in. It just stops. Like, end of simulation. The end of the VR we programmed in here. And with a crit, I think you understand that this is not real. You have not been transported to a place. Mm. You are in something that has been created artificially for reformation purposes. Whatever magic that these mirrors employ is customized to the prisoner. So this spaceship is Azrael's prison, and it looks the way it does because of something about Azrael. Got it. All right. Uh, So as that all runs through your head, I think you turn around and you go to explain that to Roland, who's just like looking into the blackness at the end of this simulation prison and just being like what in tarnation um and you hear a voice and it says now what the hell is asriel's voice sound like <laughs> they all can't they all can't be bumpkin voices man they gotta be some other voice right that's what i was just thinking he's sylvester stallone <laughs> untenable well, you know, this is a little easy you just talk uh, like one side of your mouth what if he had a boomhauer voice <laughs> Please! <laughs> that would be the worst! I was supposed to negotiate with someone. 
Oh, no, you know what? I'm bringing back the Russian. Let's see how that all treats you. Oh, sweet. Everyone loved that season, too. Uh, <laughs> I did not know I could have visitors here. <laughs> how do you like that one, guys? Uh, I'm fine with it, actually. That's my favorite. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. <laughs> and between the two of you, standing in the hallway of the spaceship, a figure descends from the ceiling as a, a god on high. And the figure that lands in front of you, who is clearly Azrael is revealed to you. And there is no other way to say this. It's a man whose head is a squid. <gasps> oh, this is beautiful. Is it, we're going to call it a mind flayer in this case, or an illithid here? Why don't you ask him? <clears throat> anyway, like Roland just sort of looks at the figure and said, huh, well, this was something that light... Neglected to mention, yep. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll, I've said it once, I'll say it again. There's no boringness keeping along with your team. <laughs> uh, Roland's going to look to Ezreal then to simply say, Well met there, Ezreal, I take it. You have taken it correctly. Now, what brings you to my eternal prison? <laughs> Well, we're hoping to make your eternal stay here a bit less eternal, if you catch my drift. Oh, so, it's a prison break, then. <laughs> it's a prison break. <laughs> uh. As always, I'd like to thank Overclocked Remix for our theme music, which includes Acoustic Jam at the Lucifer Alpha, an arrangement of Biohazard from Snatcher, Simply Be Grooved, an arrangement of Simple and Clean from Kingdom Hearts, and Mystic Chemicals, an arrangement of Mystic Cave and Chemical Plant Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog. Executive producers for July 2017 are Kerstine Haslinger, Jade, Extellaris, Joseph Timbrello, The Cult of Gorfanax, Irving Royale, Andrew Grothen, Paul Mullen, Levi the Young, Luke Powers, Michael Goodell, Brent, Anthony Sauvier, Melissa Nielsen, Dawn, Eugene T., Connor Reynolds, Sarah Likens, Pruitt Holcomb, Artemis BJJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Bristol, Francois V., Tarka, Shyness, Dennis Pancake Detlefsen, Ripter Stormwolf, Miko from Finland, Dennis Bengston, Josh Mosier, and Diego Van Dane, Allison Ansel, Sydney Marzing, Just a Jester, John Potts, Kevin Dobbins, Savard and Akrasimova, Brady Warner, Kitty Foe, James Neely, Marissa Donaldson, Melanie Joe, Lana Seawolf, Toby Gleason Stack, Ruby Offer, Matthew Weber, Sarah Hanley, Melissa Booker, Cameron Abbas, Dylan, Gary Sayon, Anna Stulfar, Sean, the host of Funk Dunk Plays, Georgie Orena, Harrison Andrew, Kevin Sidlow, Christopher Charlo, Jorit, Vigar Arnston, Cody Jackson, August Rue, Athos, and Ingmar Gremen. You can join this list by supporting the show at patreon.com slash austinyorski, and you can also help support Chris at patreon.com slash weeklymongarecap, and you can support Laura at patreon.com slash laurakbuzz. You can also help support the show indirectly by finding us on iTunes, Google Play, Podbean, YouTube, or probably other places as well, and liking, subscribing, and commenting there. And finally, I just want to thank all of our amazingly talented fan artists out there. You make doing this show infinitely more fun, and I just want to shout out the incredible Cosmignon, Jessica Sims, Eileen, Savarden, Tempest, Levi, and Okie Dokai. I think I speak for everybody here at the show when I say your incredible work inspires us every week to do our best. Thank you.